one of our leading figures in the European Parliament, who is the head of our delegation in the European Parliament and is also our spokesman on both energy and industry, is our next speaker, who is going to, as always, paint a crystal clear picture of how much better off we will be economically outside the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Roger Hellman. Well, good afternoon, conference. And can I say, first of all, how proud I am to be sharing this platform, not only with our party chairman, but with three of our new generation of UKIP MEPs. <laughs> now that you've heard those presentations from Jonathan and from Diane, none of us in this room can be in any doubt about their enthusiasm, their commitment, their professionalism, and I am proud to work with them. Now, I'd like to share with you something that I've learned in my 16 years in Brussels and Strasbourg, and it's this. The European Union's apparatchiks have a huge contempt for public opinion. Isolated in their ivory towers, they can mostly afford to ignore the voters. They think that people like you and me are just too stupid and ignorant to understand the wonderful benefits of EU membership. <laughs> but once in a while, reality strikes back and bites their ankles. For example, in 2005, when the French and the Dutch voted down the European Constitution. So did the bureaucrats change their minds and uh, uh, question the wisdom of their activities? The hell they did. No. What they did was they wrung their hands and they said, perhaps we haven't explained it quite well enough. Well, I tell you, I've spent the last 16 years explaining the European Union to voters, and the more I explain it, the angrier they get. But now at last conference, we're facing the upcoming referendum, and it is the opportunity of a lifetime. So I am going to change the habits of a lifetime. Because for 16 years, I've been telling the British people what is wrong with the European Union. But now, I believe it's time for a change. It's time to talk benefits. It's time to talk about the massive opportunities that face this country not because of the European Union, but by virtue of freedom and independence that will come with Brexit. And nowhere are these benefits clearer than in my specialist subject of energy. For three years now, as UKIP's energy spokesman, I've been setting out a plan to deliver secure and affordable energy. And while we in UKIP have a consistent policy to deliver that objective, strangely enough, other parties don't. Alex Salmond of the Scottish Nationalists wants to finance an independent Scotland on the back of North Sea gas and oil. But he also wants 100% green electricity by 2025. Jeremy Corbyn, we've heard a bit about Jeremy Corbyn today, haven't we? Jeremy Corbyn talks about reopening the coal mines, but he actually wants carbon-free electricity by 2030. And bear in mind that coal currently delivers about 30% of UK electricity. In any case, we in UKIP can't implement our plan while we're still in the EU, because we're hogtied by EU policy on climate and on emissions. So the positive message for Brexit is simply this. After Brexit, we'll be free to implement a rational energy policy that can deliver the secure and affordable energy we so desperately need. But of course, Brexit can't deliver that policy by itself. We still have to fight what Owen Paterson calls the green blob in Westminster. Uh, any similarity, of course, here to John Gummer of the Westminster Climate Change Committee is uh, entirely coincidental. <laughs> but fighting the green blob is not so hopeless as it sounds. In this area, as in so many others, UKIP policies are starting to gain traction. 
we're already seeing signs of the alarmist consensus breaking down. There's been no global warming for the last 18 years. The costs of renewable energy are increasingly unaffordable. We have a prime minister who's given up hugging huskies and who reportedly wants, quote, to get rid of the green crap. We've seen wind farm subsidies cut and wind farm plans knocked back, including most recently the enormous Navitas Bay offshore project that would have despoiled the Jurassic Coast. Now, Amber Rudd, described as Secretary of State for Climate Change and Energy, came into office last year with ambitious plans to cover the nation's roofs with solar panels. Someone, maybe it was uh, George Osborne, must have talked her through the costs of solar power because she's just announced a dramatic cut in domestic solar subsidies. As I recently tweeted, not so green, Amber Rudd gets the red light on solar subsidies. <laughs> More generally, there's a recognition that the assumptions behind the rise of renewables were just plain wrong. We were warned of the threat of peak oil, which was predicted to be happening about now. But instead of that, we see a world awash with new oil and gas fields. Of course, fossil fuels are finite and will eventually be exhausted. But that day is so far off in the future, it has no bearing at all in today's policy debates. We need to be worrying about pensioners with hypothermia today. Uh, an, underlying, an underlying assumption of the dash for renewables was that as fossil fuels became scarcer, of course they get more expensive. In fact, the reverse has happened. We've all seen what's happened to oil prices recently. And in the USA, gas prices have dropped by two-thirds as a result of the shale gas revolution. With Brexit, we can sweep away the threat to our security of supply. We can exploit indigenous coal and gas resources. We can eliminate our overdependence on renewables. But stuck with EU rules as we are today, serious industry commentators are fearful of blackouts by the winter of 2016. Under the terms of the EU's large combustion plant directive, We've seen a series of coal plant closures with consequent job losses and threats to generating capacity. Kings North in Kent, Longanet in Scotland, Egborough in Yorkshire, Ferrybridge not far behind. These closures will make not a scrap of difference to the trajectory of atmospheric CO2, nor to the climate. There are reportedly 1,200 new coal-fired power stations in the global pipeline including, surprisingly, a couple of dozen in Uber Green, Germany. They're building or refurbishing a couple of dozen coal plants and importing dirty brown coal from Poland into the bargain. Our closures will make no measurable difference. The, the IEA predicts that coal use will rise for decades. So we're currently seeing a hemorrhage of production and jobs and investment out of the UK and indeed out of the EU as a direct result of energy prices. I've often quoted former Energy Commissioner Antonio Tajani, who famously said, we are creating an industrial massacre in Europe. We in UKIP do not want to be part of that industrial massacre. <laughs> You've heard me talk before about energy intensive businesses. Recently, we've been losing steel companies. Tata Steel cut 500 jobs uh, in North... Uh, it, so I, I'm losing my place in Northumberland. It's mothballing at steel at Llanwern in Wales. 700 jobs are at risk at the steel plant in, in, in Rotherham. This affects Bill Etheridge, by the way. I don't know if he's in the hall at the moment, but there are knock-on job losses at Tata's plant at Wednesbury in the black country. Since I started drafting this speech, we've had an even bigger blow to the steel industry. In the northeast, in Redcar, the second largest blast furnace in Europe is teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. Its Thai owners have failed to meet schedule repayments and 2,000 jobs are at risk. My message for those 2,000 steel workers, you're being sacrificed to climate hysteria and to Brussels bureaucrats.
We've lost several aluminium smelters like Anglesey Aluminium in Wales and Alcan Linemouth in Northumberland. It's the same with petroleum refineries. But Petro Plus closed Teesside in 2009 and Corriton in 2012. Merco closed Milford Haven in 2014. And research commissioned and published by the British government shows that petroleum refined overseas uh, involves 35% more CO2 emissions per unit than in UK refineries. According to Jim Ratcliffe, the CEO of INEOS, the chemicals giant, 22 chemicals plants in the UK have closed since 2009, and he says that unless we resolve the energy price issue, there'll be no chemical industry left in Europe in 10 years' time. And remember, they use gas not only for energy, but also as a feedstock. The list goes on, glass, cement, paper. All these industries, all these jobs are under threat from, en from energy prices. Across Europe, there are incre increasing worries about the costs of renewables. Denmark is scaling back climate uh, emission, uh, and emissions targets, which are proving just too expensive to deliver. In Germany, De Spiegel reports that the German renewables business is in crisis. But despite these concerns, you can bet that the EU will cling doggedly to its perverse policies for years to come. The good news is that with Brexit, we can stop the hemorrhage. We can keep those jobs here at home. We can reverse the tide so that industry and jobs and investment come back to Britain. That means that, out, that means that outside the EU, we in Britain will have a dramatic competitive advantage compared to the rest of Europe when it comes to inward investment. In fact, Britain after Brexit will become the manufacturing capital of Europe. That, that's the story from industry, but there's the issue of domestic prices as well. As we get into the referendum campaign, you may find that people on the doorstep care about jobs, but don't always care that much about companies. But they all get electricity bills, and many are struggling, or their elderly relatives are struggling, to make ends meet. For them, Brexit means lower energy bills that they so desperately need. That is the positive message of Brexit for the voters of Britain. Lower domestic bills, more jobs, more investment, more growth, more prosperity. Not a bad prospectus. So conference, I think it's time for us to speak up for those 2,000 steel workers in Redcar and for all the other British workers whose jobs are threatened by perverse climate and energy policies. It's time for us to send a message to our Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, Amber Rudd, to the Chairman of Parliament's Climate Change Committee, John Gummer, now ennobled as Lord Deben, and maybe to George Osborne and David Cameron as well. Let's send a message from this hall in Doncaster, from this conference, from this party that will reverberate through the Palace of Westminster. Do we want secure and affordable energy? Yes. Do we want Britain to become the manufacturing capital of Europe? Yes. Do we want our country back? Yes. I think they're going to hear that. Colleagues, thank you so much. And if I may borrow David Steele's famous rallying cry, let's go back to our constituencies and prepare for independence.